This morning we're going to start on our uh, brief study, just four weeks, into the book of Thess 2 Thessalonians. And as I was reading through this and trying to figure out a sense of what Paul was really going over, is he was really relating to the Thessalonians um, his desire for them to understand the glory of Christ. When you read through 2 Thessalonians, it's really about the second coming of Christ. This is a question that everybody has. And even 1950 years ago, there were people worried that maybe they had missed the coming of Jesus. And there were letters being written and people saying things that Christ had already come. And Paul addresses some of that in some of his other letters. Paul wrote this one to clear up some misconceptions, some misunderstandings, and some false teachings. What you might ask is, what were those teachings? Even today, these show up. You don't have to look very far to find all sorts of teachings and opinions on the coming of Christ. I don't know why this is an issue for me as I've studied the Word of God. Because I certainly didn't set out to study the end times, but I've been in it for years, and I don't know why. I'm interested, sure, about the coming of the Lord, and I want to, I guess what really drives me, I would like to know where we're at so that I can be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. What drives me is I want to hear well done. I think this is probably what was driving Paul is too. Not so much the sensationalism about times and dates and the things that are going to happen. And, and to be sure, there are some fantastic things and some terrifying things and some just outright, outright uh, outrageous things that are going to occur before Jesus comes. And as He comes, Think of what it will be like when the, the sky grows dark with the stormiest storm you've ever seen and lightning and earthquakes and hell, fire and brimstone coming down from the sky, the world coming to its, its end in flaming fire, and then all of a sudden Jesus shows up. What a blessed day that will be. We have not seen that day yet. But there is a teaching that Paul was dealing with specifically in this passage, in this book. There's this idea that the return of Christ is imminent. And maybe you believe that. And if you do, that's fine. But the idea that Jesus can come back at any time, let me clarify this. Can He come back at any time? He's God. He can do what He wants to. But has he said in his word that certain things will come back before he returns? Absolutely. So there you go. That kills the argument of eminency. It's not just my opinion. But there were people who were saying, because the return of Christ is imminent, let's just go ahead and give up work. We'll just sit, sit around the house. We won't do anything. We'll just wait for Jesus to come back. And He'll rescue us from this sinful, evil world. We won't have to engage in the world anymore. We'll just kind of sit over here in our corner and the world will grow worse. Jesus will come back. He'll save us from it. And we won't have to worry about it anymore. But I tell you that it lulls us into a false assurance of where we're at. And there are many people who believe that, that nothing stands in the way of Jesus coming back. Is He God? Yes. Can He come back whenever He wants to? Absolutely. But what does the Scripture state? There are things that will happen before He returns. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, this, 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 and this happens before I come back. And so what that puts us in is a very different situation. We have to be doing what the Lord wants us to until He returns. Why? It's because He's worthy of that. He's worthy of the glory and the honor and the praise that comes from people who are living their lives in obedience to Him. Living their lives in a way that would honor Him. We saw some of that in 1 Thessalonians as Paul was encouraging them to live a life worthy of the calling that they've received. Why would we want to do the things Jesus is telling us to? I mean, there are great rewards that are coming beyond our imagination. And the Lord has good things in store. That's, 
basically an overview of the whole book. I've gave it away, but we're going to go through this passage together. I want you to understand that even now there are people who are teaching these things, and they're misleading many. Why work when he was coming? Well, Jesus said so. Paul wrote to correct these false teachings. Paul was writing to, to set some people on the straight path and show an order of an events and encourage people to be faithful to the very end. Paul's response to their questions about the return of Christ was a fitting response. There is a righteous judgment coming when the glory of Christ is revealed. And that leads us to a right viewpoint so that we can live our life in a way that honors the Lord and that makes us worthy of that kingdom that is coming. Let me read what Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul and Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it was only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you as well as or who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. For our testimony to you was believed. To this end also we pray for you always that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, in order that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in Him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've ever read through this book, maybe in a, your devotion time or as you've been personally studying. It doesn't take very long to read through this, the three chapters that are in this book. There's a lot of information that Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians. And you've got to remember, how long was he with the Thessalonians? Three weeks. And he shared so many mighty things with them. The gospel that saves, how to live a sanctified life, and the reason of our hope. We're looking for the blessed return of Jesus Christ. And where does Paul start in this passage? Where does he start? Well, he starts where he picked, off, picked up with, even in the first one. Paul deals with suffering and persecution. Why is it such a big issue for some people, for all of us? I know nobody likes to go out there and be picked on. Nobody wants to be persecuted. Nobody wants to go out there and have a bad day. But it's part of the Christian experience. Even Jesus himself, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he says, take heart, I've overcome the world. Paul would later write that it's part of our calling is not only to believe, but to suffer for his namesake. And he lived that out. In Philippi, in Thessaloniki, all along the way in his missionary journeys. He was stoned, he was, you know, shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was, you know, on the run day after day. And he was a man for whom the world was not enough. The people didn't like him. And there are people even today who are suffering for their faith. And who are we to, to think that? we would deserve any less or endure any less or be called to any less. We're comfortable. I'm grateful that we can meet oh, so freely in our country. But even as we see what's going on in our day, who are we to know what might happen next with all the craziness that's happening? 
We, we've already had the government tell us not to meet before. And many churches shut down because of it. But what would it take for, uh, for to, to really destroy the church would be just all, you know, just think about all the bad things that could happen. If we could not meet in this place anymore, would we meet as some do in underground churches? Would we meet as some do in house churches? Would we meet as some do in spots in the woods where nobody can find them or caves in the ground? Would we be willing to do that? Would we be willing to endure the loss of all worldly things just so that we can share Christ with one another? I, I dare say that that would clarify a lot of people's faith. I, I dare say that that would put in perspective what's the most important things. I think we've been lulled into a false sense of security in a lot of ways. A fitting response from Paul. He says, grace and peace to you, this greeting of love. And he says, oh, we've all, we ought to always give thanks to God for you. Giving thanks to God for others who know the Lord is always the most fitting response. Do you know people who love Jesus? You should be praying for them. And every time you see them, you should be so glad to see them. You have a kinship that goes beyond flesh and blood. You have the Spirit inside of you, and we're going to spend eternity with the Lord together. What a blessing that will be. And the fitting response is that we give thanks to God for them. Do you have family that knows the Lord? Praise God for them. Do you have, do you have enemies that know the Lord? <laughs> Forgive them. <laughs> you know, thank God for them. <laughs> maybe, maybe the Lord could work in that relationship so you're no longer enemies but brothers. And you can get over whatever the problem was that caused separation between you. And the Lord will be glorified in that. Giving thanks to God is always fitting. Paul says in everything, give thanks. How, how often our voices are filled with complaint as opposed to thanksgiving. When we think about how gracious God has been to us, how much grace has been poured out in our lives, how much the peace of God has filled our lives as we followed Him, we should be thankful above all. And thankfulness is really the starting point where we understand God has forgiven us of so much. I look back at my own life and I'm grateful for the forgiveness of the Lord. I'm thankful that Jesus died on the cross. I'm thankful that God was willing to forgive. Because if it wasn't for Him, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> and I would have no hope for this life or for eternity. We should be thankful above all. Thankful to God for what He's done for us. Thankful to God what He's done for others. Thankful to God for what He will do for those that we're praying for. Thankful to God is the fitting response. And Paul says, look, I'm thankful to God for your faith that is enlarged. Think about this. Maybe when you first got married, you lived in a small house. Ned and I lived in a borrowed shed that was converted to a house for about a year. It was small. But we didn't have a lot of stuff. In fact, it was more than large enough for us to live in. And then we grew as a family and added more kids to it. And I look back on pictures of our house when we first built it 20-some years ago, and it's sparse and not, not as many things in there. And we had bookshelves, and they weren't quite full. And I, I think about how, how much the Lord has filled it. Filled it to overflowing to the point where it's had to have been enlarged. Our faith grows. And as it grows to fill up who we are, the Lord enlarges it to fill it even more. So as it overflows, we enlarge even more. When I see someone's faith growing, I am so thankful for that. When I see someone's faith in the Lord growing, it is so exciting because the Lord is doing greater and bigger things in them. And maybe they start out with some small thing of maybe they're overcoming some sin. And they're so excited that the Lord gave them freedom. And the next thing you know, maybe they're sharing the gospel with somebody and they're winning people to Christ. What a blessing that is. And their faith grows. The next thing you know, they're off on mission trips or they're planting churches or whatever it might be. Their faith is growing. And Paul was looking out there at the Thessalonians and saying, Guys, I was with you for three weeks. And you believed. And I'm so excited that your faith is growing. I'm thanking God on a daily basis that the Lord is enlarging your faith. 
lot of people think about church growth, they think about the numbers. And numbers are great, but what I look at is what is God doing in your life? Can you look back and see what God has done in your life this past week, this past month, since the year started? We're already at the end of February. Can you believe it? Has God been moving? Have you been trusting Him? Paul was thanking God for their faith. God makes it bigger as it grows. Only God can do that. Your love was growing toward one another. The love the Thessalonians had for one another was growing. Do we love each other more? Do we love each other more because of the grace of God given to us? When we see other people who love Jesus, do we get excited and love them more? And we show love. Are we more loving? Are we more loving to the people who don't know Jesus? That's a test. Now, I think one of the reasons why God brings people into our circles, into our sphere of life, and it might just be something that we would consider an off-chance passing uh, contact or, or uh, an accident or whatever it is, it's because the Lord is trying to grow us so that we can show love to other people. Maybe you've got love down in your sphere of people that you know. You love your family. You love your kids. You love your extended family. You might love your neighbors. And then God brings somebody else in your life. And that's a challenge, right? Because they're rubbing you raw, and you don't know what to do with this person. And they won't. God's just like, here's your, next, here's your next assignment. Are we loving? Is our love growing toward one another? And Paul was looking at the Thessalonians and saying, your faith is greatly enlarged, and your love toward one another grows ever greater. I'm so thankful for that. I thank God on a daily basis for that. Who wouldn't praise the Lord for, for that type of thing? That's a fitting response. Continuous growth in our faith is what matters the most. I would encourage you, get into the Word, pray, be obedient, but understand when we love one another, that matters. When we love God and when we love others, those are so super important. When you look at the list of the Ten Commandments, you can break them down in two categories. The first four, love God. The final six, love your neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Not putting up with their nonsense, but really loving them. Loving as God does. and Helping them become better and, and encouraging them along the way. You can love somebody without accepting their sin. You can love somebody without congratulating them for their dumb decisions. You can help them through that and help them become mature and help them to come to understand what repentance is. And this is what Paul was doing for them. He understood, guys, I'm so excited when I see your love and your faith growing and what the Lord is doing with this. And so much so that Paul said, we speak proudly of you. When we talk about what the Lord has done in Thessaloniki, to other people like we were just there for a short time and God did a mighty work we're so proud of what God is doing we're so proud of you we're so proud of what God is doing I would like to share what the Lord has done because let me tell you what God has been doing and guys when I see God do things here in this church the things that he's done here it's an encouragement to me and I tell people about it I tell people about some of the things that the Lord has done, and it, you know, because I look at those things and I say, that's not something I could have accomplished. And I'm grateful for what God has done and is doing, and how each one of us are following the Lord in that. We should. We speak proudly. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they went all sorts of other places to minister. Paul was in, Th in Athens. Paul went on to Rome. Paul went back and forth all over the place, back to Jerusalem, back to Antioch, back to all these other places. And he was sharing with other people what, the, what God had been doing. It's fitting. He was speaking proudly of their perseverance. We speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance. You know how well we persevere? Not very well at some times. But it's a growth Thing. The Lord is calling us to perseverance. And perseverance is really just a lifelong step-by-step -step obedience. And God is telling you to do this, and you do it, and you stay, and you endure. He said, we speak proudly of your perseverance and faith. And faith. But then he puts it in context. 
your perseverance in faith in the midst of your persecutions. Somebody being mean to you or disagreeing with you on social media is not perseverance, is not persecution. There are a lot of people who, in our day and age, have no clue what persecution is. We don't truly understand what affliction is. We do in some things. Many of us have lived difficult lives. Many of us have gone through some very difficult things, and we understand that aspect of it. But we have not faced persecution and affliction along those, those, those lines as, say, maybe our brothers and sisters in Muslim countries or in communist countries. We can freely meet and study the Bible as we wish. We can openly pray and share the gospel. As of yet, there are no laws that are going to throw you in prison because you've shared the gospel. Now, some of those things are there, and people have been put in jail, and, and it's there. I'm not saying it's not, but, but you're not at risking your life to come to church this morning. But we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are, just not in this place. And they're, they're dying for their faith. There are people that you'll never know about who have given their life for Christ this week. Jesus knows who they are, but you'll never hear about them. And they're facing persecution on a day-to-day -day basis. Persecution is coming here. It's been elsewhere for ages. Underground churches, house churches, secret churches. Could you imagine taking a Bible and tearing the pages apart just so that you can spread that one Bible out and you'd memorize what's on that page? How many Bibles do you have in your home? I know I've got many. But what would it be like if you couldn't have it? Would you remember any of it? Do you understand what I'm saying? We have been protected, we've been blessed. But it might be that the Lord sees fit because of the foolish direction that our country has gone and the shallowness of a lot of faith in our country that the Lord might see fit as He brings this world to its end to send persecution even in this place to purify His church. Persecution has to do with things like imprisonment. Paul was persecuted. He was imprisoned. Things like torture. Paul was, he was beaten. He was stoned. They tried to kill him. Persecution has to do with things like death. And I don't think any one of us here have ever faced that. Any one of those three for the Lord. But the Thessalonians had. And as Paul saw what they were going through, he was thanking God for their faithfulness and the work the Lord was doing in them. Paul thanking God for their strength in the middle of persecution is a fitting response. Why does Paul start here with persecution? We're talking about the coming of the Lord. Isn't that an exciting thing to think about the return of Christ? That's what we all want, right? We want Jesus to come back. But Paul starts with persecution and faithfulness and endurance during the middle of this. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. It gives us perspective. And I want you to understand that when persecution comes, God's not unaware of it. In fact, God allows it. Cleansing begins with the house of God first. And Jesus suffered and died on the cross. And there are many passages in the New Testament that speak of how we also will suffer with Him and how it's, it's a good thing for us to, to stand up underneath that and, and to honor Him and be faithful and endure it. We should never run from that. It might, it might shock us when we first experience it. We might not know what to do with it. But what we, what we need to do is condition ourselves to not shirk that off, to not run, to not be unfaithful, but to endure because Christ is coming. The Lord is coming, and He has a righteous judgment that's coming with Him. Now think about this. Their suffering and persecution, the fact that they were going through that, Paul says, this is a plain indication of the righteous judgment of God. 
If the world persecutes the church and those who love the Lord, if the world is going out of its way to crush those who love the Lord, is God not righteous in His judgment on the world? There is a reason why God's going to judge this world. Yes, it is the sin of mankind, but even as we look to the book of Revelation, why does the mystery Babylon fall? Because in it was found the blood of the saints and martyrs. This world does not love God. And the Lord will bring righteous judgment on it. God is not unjust in His judgment. He is completely just in His judgment. God has righteous judgment. It's a plain indication. He's, he's, he's doing those things. He's judging them, and through their persecution, He's making us worthy of the kingdom. God will repay. Now think about this. When somebody is mean to you, when somebody cuts you off, when somebody says something unright, what is your response? Your, your natural response might be to strike back. That's a very human response to, to uh, get back at them, to say something even worse, to, to give likewise as they've got, done to you. And then we hear the words of Jesus that says, turn the other cheek. And, and we don't know how to de deal with that. And yet the Lord's saying, look, when you suffer, it's not your job to repay that. God over and over again in the Scripture says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And everybody looks at this world and says, Why are the crazy things going on that are going on? Why is there so much problems in this world? Where is God? Is God deaf? Is He blind? Is He just avoiding it? Is He on vacation somewhere? God sees all of it. And the Lord will be righteous in His judgment when that day comes. Well, God's going to repay their suffering, the suffering of the Thessalonians. God's going to repay Paul's suffering. God's going to repay our suffering. We just have to surrender that to the Lord. When's He going to do that? When is He going to do that? When will He repay the affliction and give relief to us who are afflicted? Sometimes He allows some relief in this life, but we know from the Scripture that a day of rest is coming. The millennial reign of Christ is where the Lord's going to repay all of that. If you've given up houses or lands or family or whatever it is for the Lord's sake, the Lord will bless you even a hundred times more in the coming kingdom and on into eternity. And when Jesus returns, when the Lord Jesus shall return from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, He's coming to judge this world. God will repay our suffering. He's going to bring the wrath of God. He's going to bring that final judgment. God will give us rest in the millennial kingdom. When is, it, when is God going to repay? At the right time. When He comes to set up His kingdom. When Jesus is revealed from heaven. When the wrath of God is being poured out from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution on those who don't love God, who don't know God, who don't obey His commandments. You see, there's only two types of people in this world. Those who have been born again, saved by the power of God through the grace of God, and those who haven't. And we pray that those who haven't will come to faith in Christ and be born again so they can be forgiven. And you might have your worst enemy out there, but you should want your worst enemy out there to know and love the Lord so that they can, they can avoid an eternal destruction. God has been gracious to you. We should want God to be gracious even to them because the Lord can change our hearts. If God can change your stubborn heart, if God can change my stubborn heart, God can change their stubborn heart too and give them grace and mercy, just like He gave to us. Did any of us deserve it? No. No. All of us deserve the righteous judgment of God. And the Lord poured out righteous judgment on Christ. But for those who refuse to believe the gospel of Christ, the righteous judgment of God will be poured out on them. Where is God in all this worldly trouble? God will repay.
when we turn on the news and we see murder, genocide, torture, persecution, human trafficking, and all of the evils that go with all of that. That does not happen in a vacuum, and God is not ignorant. God sees all and will repay all in His righteous judgment. Nobody will escape that. If you faced persecution, <coughs> let's just say that you were somebody who faced genocide. God forbid that should happen here. And all of your family was taken. God forbid that should occur. Would you be angry when God repays judgment on your people who harmed you? Would you be angry at God's judgment? Or would you say it's righteous, Lord? Many people are powerless to do anything about those who harm them. But when we trust in the Lord, do you understand? When you trust in the Lord, you have the God of the universe who created all things by the breath of His mouth, who if you're trusting in Him and you're under His grace, He will repay those who trouble you, and they won't be able to do anything about it. Only well, they have a choice. They could repent and come to know the Lord, and the Lord would be gracious to them. That's what we want, right? But they're living in that sin, and they're causing so much damage. God sees it. He's going to repay. How will God repay? <laughs> Fire and brimstone and hail from the sky. An asteroid, a comic strike. Demonic hordes from the abyss, death to his enemies. He's going to tread the winepress of his great wrath alone. Jesus himself will do it. Worldwide cataclysm that burns with fire. This whole world will come to an end as God pours out his wrath on the earth. All of the cities of the nations will fall. There's a lot of cities. God will be righteous in His judgment. He will return in power. The heavens will split open and He will be revealed. What does that tell us? If He is revealed right now, He's being veiled. Is He here? Yes, we just can't see Him. There's more to this world than what we can see, and Jesus is watching everything. Why in the judgment do the, do the thrones sit and people are given judgment when they open up the books? What's in those books? Everything that has ever been done. The Lord wrote His story before every time was, but when He judges, He's going to judge from the things written in the books Everything that has ever been done has been written down by some angelic scribe, perhaps, that God has put in a place. That's his job. We're watching everything. It's not just the NSA or, or the deep state government that's paying attention to all your spending habits and suggesting things that you talked about with somebody that wasn't on your phone. I mean, it's kind of creepy when you think about it. You know, you might talk to somebody about whatever it is, bananas. The next thing you know, it's on your phone, right? Here's a sale for bananas. And that seems something simple. God sees everything. There's nowhere you can go that the Lord is not. And there's nothing you can do that God can't see. The Lord is going to return in power and He's going to destroy this world system and bring deep judgment, swift judgment on it. And it will be complete and it will be thorough and it will be final and it will be full. Why will He do this? The Lord is going to come in His glory with all of His holy angels. He alone is worthy of glory. He alone is worthy of praise. And when He comes, the whole world will cry out and say, Oh no, it's the day of wrath and He is really coming. But what will those who know the Lord do? We'll rejoice. Why will we rejoice? As if we have to ask that question. It's because He's come. 
Our hope is here. And no matter what difficulty we might go through, when Jesus comes, He'll set everything right. When Jesus comes, He'll make everything right. When the Lord comes in righteous judgment, this world will finally have peace. Those who do not know God will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. It's not momentary. It's eternal. And when we die and pass from this life, there is no more opportunity. And these individuals will face it for eternity. This is how much the Lord will repay all of the evil and sin in this world. He'll do it eternally. He'll, they'll pay the penalty of eternal destruction. They'll be away from the presence of the Lord. They'll be away from the glory of His power. Those who don't know God, that's where they'll be. His glory will be revealed when He comes to be glorified in His saints. His saints will gather around. On that day, there'll be marvel among them because Jesus has come back. I'm not a huge fan of musicians and art, entertainment artists and sports figures and all that. But we've all seen people's reactions to whoever's famous, right? Everyone was ooing and aahing over the Super Bowl because it had, you know, two people out of eight billion who are somehow more important than anybody else. When Jesus comes back, everybody's going to know who He is. I mean... I'm known by a handful of people in this world, but everybody knows who Jesus is. And everybody's going to gather around, and those who love the Lord are going to be gathered around Him, and they're going to praise His glorious name. And even those who don't know Him are going to bow the knee and confess Him to be Lord. The whole world will marvel at His coming. He'll come back in His power and glory, and it will be such a great day. Oh, it'll be such a great day. Paul says, look, He's going to be marveled at among all who believe. And he says this, For our testimony to you was believed. All the things that Paul was thanking God for, their faith, their endurance, their love, it was proof that they believed. You believed. Our testimony was believed. We're so grateful that you won't be one of these who were a part of the eternal destruction. That you won't be one of these who are condemned and judged at the coming of the Lord. That Jesus took that on Himself in your place. Our testimony was believed. To this end we pray. To what end? That people will believe and that they'll avoid the righteous judgment of God. That, that Jesus will take the judgment for them. That they can be forgiven and born again and free. To this end we pray. The coming of the Lord. Our faithfulness through endurance and persecution. To this end we pray. For you always to be counted worthy of the coming kingdom. That you be counted worthy of your calling. And that God would fulfill in you every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power. We're praying. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would be considered worthy of that, that you would live up to the calling that God has put on your life, that your life would be lived in such a way that others would look at you and go, I don't know what happened, but something changed, and isn't God must be doing something. I don't get it. And the Lord can be glorified in you and through you, and you're just living your life, honoring the Lord. That when Jesus comes back, that you won't have a reason to shirk back and go, oh no, He's come. You'll be excited because you know you've been living your life for Him. That maybe the end goal that you have in mind, and this should be your end goal, that you would hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That you're doing what the Lord says until the day He returns. For that end, we pray, that you always be counted worthy of your calling. Always. Even on your bad days. All the way to the very end. Paul was praying for them, thankful for their, for their faith, thankful for their love. And he continued to pray for them, that all the way to the end they would be counted worthy of the calling, so that the name of Jesus would be glorified. It's going to be glorified on that final day. But wouldn't we want the name of Jesus to be glorified among us even now? Isn't he worthy? Isn't Jesus worthy of all the praise and honor and glory that our life can give Him if we faithfully follow Him? Is He worthy of that? He's going to get the praise one way or the other. Do you understand this? 
the Lord will receive glory for judging sin one way or the other. He's going to receive glory because Jesus took the sin of the world upon Himself and took it for you when you put faith in Him. And He's going to receive the glory because you were born again and sanctified and purified and made holy. Or He's going to be glorified because you refused Him and in His righteous judgment He will pour out full wrath upon you. And He'll receive the glory for that. He receives the glory either way. But He's worthy that we would live a life worthy of the calling we received and honor and give Him glory now. And so the Lord's worthy of that. So that the name of Jesus would be glorified in you. Right now. And on that day. And not only would God be glorified in you, but that you would be in Him. You would be found in Him. And the Lord will receive the glory for that according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We just skip right over that because it just seems like a small little addendum, right? According to the grace of God. You know how powerful the grace of God is. You should know. Because it is the grace of God that has forgiven all of your sin. If God has so forgiven our sin, how should we live? How then should we live? How should we love? How should we act? How should we respond to one another? How should we be in this world? The grace of God is so powerful. We need to know what God's Word says so that we can be ready for what is coming. It might be our passing from this place and we'll be ready to stand before the Lord. It might be for faithfulness to endure something difficult that we might go through this week. It might ultimately be persecution. We don't know. But we should understand what the Scripture says so that we can be found worthy and be living the life that God is telling us to live. And we obey Him. He wants us to grow in our faith. He wants us to grow in our love. He wants us to grow in our endurance. And when we face persecution, and we might, we need to understand that God will repay those who harm us. That we can forgive them and we can set our eyes on Jesus and say, Lord, you take care of it because I can't. Not even on our best day could we give an insult back that would even be worthy of it. But Lord, you are the one to be praised. You are the one that's worthy of all things. And in you we put our hope God will repay the harm against us because He is coming in power. He is coming in glory. He is coming and He will judge this world. And He will reward those who are found in Him. And I don't know about you, I'm grateful that the Lord saved me, but I want to see God do that for others as well. When we hear people say, oh no, it's a, just pick your thing. It's an eclipse. That means Jesus is coming back. Does that mean Jesus is coming back? Maybe, but it ain't today, okay? And you might hear somebody say, oh no, what about the red heifers? Who cares? They're cows, right? <laughs> Jesus is coming back on His time schedule. Or you might go, oh no, who's going to be elected as president? Does it matter? No. What matters is, are you following the Lord? Nothing should dissuade us from that. It doesn't matter who the world do, what the world does or what the world says or who thinks they're in control of this place. God is going to come back in His own time. And He's going to work things out according to the power of His will. And what we're to do is be faithful and be found in Him to the very end. He is worthy. He's worthy of all praise and honor and power and glory because He has forgiven us so much. He is God. And He's so worthy. He is worthy. He's worthy of the light and momentary afflictions that we might face here. And when we find rest in Him, He's worthy. And we'll praise Him forever because He's worthy. But we're in Him. Let's pray.
Lord God, we come to you this morning. We just want to praise you, Lord, for you're worthy. And Lord, we look forward to the day that you return. And God, we pray that you would do that soon. We see this world around us deteriorating, Lord, and we just pray that it's even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we might even live in the generation that you come, Lord, and we just look forward to that. But if it's not the case, Lord, we just want to be faithful to the very end, Lord God. Lord God, would you help us to grow in love and faith and endurance and patience, to put our trust in you, Lord God, and to hope, hope evermore for your return. Bless your people now, even, Lord God, as we leave. Father, in this time of invitation, Father, I pray that you would do as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.